On this week's episode, we're not interviewing a doctor or health professional of any kind. I'm actually interviewing a patient caregiver. Patients often feel like that doctors are the only source of health knowledge. The truth is that when you can't find help from a doctor, you often have to find answers on your own. Joan Beale is a wife, blogger, and MS patient advocate who played a major role in getting a controversial and life-changing multiple sclerosis treatment to the United States. Her husband was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and as a result, she became a citizen scientist and had to dug, dig through mountains of scientific literature to find answers for her husband's care. This episode has a ton of really profound thoughts and had me rethink how I have conversations with my own patients. I really think this is one of the best episodes for wisdom and advice for self-healing that I've done so far, mostly, becomes, mostly because it comes from an empowered patient. Let us know what you think on social media. And as always, feel free to go to iTunes, give us a five-star review, and let us know how you're doing. To find show notes and to become a subscriber to this show, go to healyourselfradio.com and hit the subscribe button, and there'll be tons of new information on there, as well as a chance to check out some of our previous episodes. Today's episode is brought to you by Atlas of Life, the natural latex travel neck pillow. This month, we are giving away one travel neck pillow to a lucky listener. If you want a chance to win this pillow, then go ahead to HealYourselfRadio.com and become a subscriber to our newsletter. Um, Atlas of Life produces a 100% natural latex pillow. It's non-allergenic, and it's going to protect your neck when you have to sleep on a long plane or if you're traveling a long distance inside of a car, you want to make sure that your neck is protected and Atlas of Life pillows are custom designed to provide the most comfort and most protection for your cervical spine. You're listening to the Heal Yourself radio podcast. Unleash the Doctor Within with your hosts, Dr. Jonathan Chung and Dr. Gregory Jean-Pierre. Welcome to another episode of Heal Yourself Radio. It's Dr. Jonathan Chung bringing you the best information on becoming an empowered patient and learning to heal yourself. And today we have a uh, unique guest in that we're not interviewing a healthcare provider or someone that's in fitness. We're actually going to be talking to someone who has great experience in being a caregiver and actually being an empowered patient and making informed healthcare decisions for yourself. So I'd like to welcome Joan Beal onto the show. Hello, nice to meet you. So Joan has a very interesting story that I'm going to um, allow her to tell. Um, basically, her husband was diagnosed with MS and she now runs a blog called MS The Vascular Connection, and I'll give the links and the URL for the show notes to her blog. Um, but that's some really cool information about um, cutting edge treatments for MS. The, a lot of her ideas are controversial, but they're helping a lot of people. And I want Joan to be able to talk to some of that. So Joan, can you tell us a little about your story? Of course, I'd be happy to. Um... Jeff was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis eight years ago. And when Jeff was diagnosed, he had a lot of really strange lab results. Um, not only did he have, you know, the lesions on the brain and the banding in cerebrospinal fluid, but his blood results came back really strange. And um, he had horrible liver enzymes. He had hypercoagulation in his blood. Um, and I, so I asked his neurologist what was going on because I thought maybe there was something going on that we could address um, to get him healthier. And she kind of rolled her eyes at me and she said, oh, he's probably drinking alcohol. And this really shocked me, you know, didn't drink. And her attitude was, you know, that this had nothing to do with MS. And I don't know about you, but the way I was raised is that the body's connected. And that if you have something going on in one part of the body and, and you have a symptom in another part, it's, it's good to look at the body as a whole. So I was really surprised by her attitude that his blood results didn't mean anything or his inflammation didn't mean anything. So, um, you know, we went home and we kind of dealt with trying to help Jeff. And he had some really horrible symptoms when he was diagnosed. He had trouble walking. He had dizziness. He had numbness in his feet. And he was so depressed. It was 
really, really a very difficult time in our lives. Um, and I'm sure people listening that have multiple sclerosis would understand this, but I really felt like I wanted to understand what was going on with him, his whole body. So I went to the library and I took out all the books I could on MS and I got online and I started reading journals and recent research into MS. And I saw that there was a whole connection to the blood and the vascular system that had been made in this disease since the 1860s and all the way up into the 20th century that had been forgotten. Who looked at the blood. And one doctor whose books I read was Dr. Roy Swank. And he came up with a population and high liver enzymes and blood spots called petechiae that all the things that I saw in Jeff, he saw in his patients in the 1950s. And he treated them with diet. So that was how I got into sort of the way of looking at MS as having a vascular component. And so I cleaned out our kitchen and I, I got rid of all of Jeff's dairy and meats and he was not a happy camper. But within months of following Dr. Swank's diet, he felt better. And when he went in and had his blood checked again, his liver enzymes were down, his, his inflammation numbers were down, and he was coming out of his first big flare. So I knew there was something there dealing with um, a vascular connection. And that's really how I started this journey. Very interesting. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people underestimate is the power of having um, food, the right food intake that you have to treat chronic disease. Um, one of the things that is, uh, is probably a really, really big challenge is what what do you do to make sense of these complex medical journals, these complex medical books and ideas? If you're just a layperson, what resources do you use to try to make sense of all that? <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, when I started, it's funny. Everything just looked like gobbledygook. And um, I have a background as an opera singer. So I had to study Italian and French and German and other languages, and I understood Latin. So for me, kind of taking apart medicalese wasn't as difficult, but I used a medical dictionary, you know, no big surprise. And if I didn't understand what a term meant, I just dug deeper and deeper and deeper until I really got the concept. So for me, I tried not to let medical ease keep me from getting at the truth and the essence of what um, a, a medical abstract or paper could tell me. So when I started, a word that kept showing up in all of the papers I was reading was endothelium, endothelial health, endothelial dysfunction in relationship to this vascular connection that I had seen. And as I dug deeper and deeper, I saw that a lot of cardiovascular doctors were looking at how to improve the health of the cells that line our blood vessels. That's all endothelial cells are. And that there was a bunch of research that was just beginning to connect this, not only to cardiovascular disease, but also to neurodegenerative diseases like MS. So I just kept reading and I would take notes and, um, it, my vocabulary grew, and for someone who has no science background, I can now sit down at medical conferences and talk to doctors and discuss nitric oxide and, you know, endothelial-derived um, relaxing factor and all of these all of these things in cerebrovascular disease, and and know what I'm talking about. So I would say to people who are just starting on this journey, don't be stymied by it. You can learn. Um, but you're going to have to like become a student and study and dig and um, and be patient with yourself. But don't let that keep you from learning. I believe everyone, everybody has the the ability to learn from um, medical research. Absolutely, and I think that's um, something that, especially nowadays, it's two. It's the year two thousand fifteen, and medical research is becoming more open source and um, people are having access to full text and at the very least people have access to abstracts. So yeah. it's something that 
um, people can become empowered with health information if they're willing to look for it. Absolutely. I agree. And I think that's been the greatest revolution is having all of this knowledge at our fingertips. I mean, it sometimes gets downplayed, you know, like people are becoming hypochondriacs, but I, I see the other side of it, which is that we can become empowered and understand how our bodies work. And I think that's a, a wonderful, wonderful um, revolution that's happening. That's awesome. So um, I want you to talk about your blog a little bit um, and talk about what makes the idea of CCSVI, chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, um, why is it so controversial? Why are people butting heads with this idea? And um, what have you seen the impact with it with some of the, your readers and your husband? Yeah, so unfortunately, CCSVI has become controversial, but really, it's, it's a very, very simple idea. So I was already um, researching the vascular connection, and I contacted a researcher at Stanford University, Dr. John Cook, and I sent him research that I had put together on the endothelium and on the vascular connection to MS long before I ever read Dr. Paolo Zamboni's uh, publication on CCSVI. So I already had a relationship with the cardiovascular doctors at Stanford. Dr. Cook me back. He thought the research I put together was really interesting, and he said, you know, we don't look at MS as a disease of um, a vascular problem. You're absolutely right, but there's a lot here. So we started an email conversation, and he was really great. He checked out the program that I had made up for Jeff that I'd put him on, the diet lifestyle program, and that's called the endothelial health program. And he said, wow, this is great. I think it would benefit Jeff. Um, let me know how this is going. Let's stay in touch. Now, when I read Paolo Zamboni's um, abstract, and actually his whole paper was published, uh, it was open access. And when I read this, I couldn't believe it. He had found obstruction in the veins that was causing a reflux of blood into the brain of people with MS. And this really, really made sense to me um, with what I was seeing with Jeff's disease. And so I sent that paper to the doctors at Stanford, and they were so intrigued that they actually reached out to Dr. Zamboni and met him at a medical conference and talked with him. And when they came back, Dr. Michael Date called me and said, please, would you like to bring Jeff up to be tested? I think there's something here. So that's actually how it all started in North America, was um, through this these wonderful doctors at Stanford who had um, accepted, you know, I was just a housewife and an <laughs> opera singer, and, and here they are, you know, really, really ready and able to look at Jeff and see what was going on with his venous system, his veins. So we went up to Stanford, and Jeff had an uh, MRV, which is Magnetic Resonance Venography, and they looked at his veins, um, his jugular veins, and um, all the veins in his head, his brain, then were draining to his heart. And what they saw was that, especially on his left side, his jugular was completely closed off. It was stenosed. There was no blood coming through his jugular vein when he lay down. And it was going through collateral veins, which was slowing down the blood flow in his head. And I remember Dr. Dake showed us this image and he turned around his chair in the office and he said, oh my goodness, this is real. This is not good for his brain. And so then, you know, it was up to Jeff really to decide, did he want to have this treated? What did he want to do? And we talked to other doctors. We took about a month and um, Jeff decided he wanted to be treated. He wanted to see if Dr. Dake could open up this vein. So Jeff was the first American treated for CCSVI. He had venography at Stanford. They placed um, one stent in his right jugular, which was 80% uh, stenosed, and then a couple stents in his left, which was 99 to 100% stenosed. And I'll tell you what, he had an immediate and profound um, remission in fatigue, heat intolerance, his balance came back. 
he was able to get back on his bicycle. Um, he was able to exercise outside in the heat, which he hadn't been able to do for two years. And immediately we saw a change in his fatigue levels, uh, his energy. It was just profound, the effect that it had on him. And it enabled him to become active again. And now he's downhill skiing and jogging again. So this is um, six years later from his, um, his um, venoplasty that he had at Stanford. So obviously there was a connection here. And I saw it, and I, so I started writing about it online. And um, more and more people with MS learned about this. A news program in Canada learned about it and picked it up. And it, it really did become a worldwide phenomena. Now, maybe it shouldn't have been put on the internet. Maybe we needed more clinical trials, double blinding, but, but the cat was out of the bag. And so people, not understanding that this was something that was still in the beginning stages, wanted to be treated right away. So medical tourism happened. Uh, we had people who were injured by the procedure. It was, really, it was really heartbreaking to watch because we knew that for some people with MS, this was real. Maybe not everyone, but for some. But sadly, uh, it just, it exploded. And I think what happened then was that neurologists said that this was just another, you know, snake oil and people were being sold a bill of goods and there was nothing there. When in fact, there was a lot there. Dr. Dake ended up treating 40 patients and published a paper Cook. And m most of the, the patients did have a relief in fatigue, tolerance, many regained balance. So there was a connection there. Awesome. It's a uh, quite a. It's really a remarkable story, and that's um, one of the big reasons that I've been interested in it as an upper cervical chiropractor. Is we we've always been looking for a mechanism for why upper cervical chiropractors have been able to help some of these same type of patients, and some of the work that you know Dr. Rosa is doing, um, the organization I'm involved with, with the uh, NUCO organization has been doing, is showing there might be some overlap here, and it's pretty exciting to be a part of that, um, even though there's a controversy there, but let's be honest, uh, chiropractors have never been shy about <laughs> controversy in the past 150 years. Yes, well, there. the thing is that there is a connection, obviously, and we know it now. There's a connection with cerebrospinal fluid, blood, and the newly discovered lymphatic vessels that all flow through the neck and all drain into the jugular veins. So as you know, if there's a bony obstruction or if there's some sort of misalignment in the upper cervical, that can pinch uh, the jugular veins and close off um, fluid that's draining. So obviously there's a connection there. This is all interrelated. And that's been the exciting thing to watch in the past uh, six years since Jeff was treated is how this is expanding and um, we're bringing in more and more doctors and researchers into the International Society for Neurovascular Disease. And that's the group that was started by all of these doctors that began this. Dr. Paolo Zamboni is the founder. And then Dr. Dake is, of course, a member. And there are all of these members that have been brought in. And Dr. Scott Rosa has spoken at a conference now. So they are looking at this from every angle and that to me is so exciting i agree so one of the things i want to uh, pick your brain about is obviously you know the illness didn't affect you directly it affected your husband um what are some important things for people that are in the same situation as you how do you become a better caregiver and be a supportive spouse or family member for someone with a chronic um labeled terminal disease? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think I became very active, but if you talk to people, every caregiver is different in how they um, handle the situation. Jeff and I have been married for a very long time. We're partners, and I felt really responsible to help him reclaim some of his health. Um, I think... I called myself cheerleader on the This Is MS board because I think that was my main goal right away was to be his cheerleader, to tell him, listen, I still love you. 
you're still the same person. I know you're dealing with this illness, but I'm here for you in whatever capacity I can help you with. Um, when I started changing his diet and his program, Jeff was really angry. He was very resistant to this. And um, when he explained to me later, I understood why. It was because he felt that I blame him for being sick because he felt as though I was looking at him saying, well, if you ate better and exercised better and dealt with stress, you wouldn't be sick. And that was true. That's not what I felt at all. I wasn't blaming him. Obviously, there are genetic components to disease we have no control over. What I was trying to do was deal with the that, that we could change, the things we could change to help him feel better. And so that was nutrition, exercise, dealing with stress, getting UV rays, which has turned out to be a huge benefit of health. We're still learning about. Um, so I was there to help him find all of the things that he could change in his life to feel better. And it wasn't about blaming. So that's the one thing. If you're going to be a proactive caregiver, make sure your loved one realizes that you're not blaming them for being sick, that you are really trying to help them live their best life. And it's the same thing if you're trying to help a spouse lose weight or a child lose weight. It, you, it, can, be, it can be very a difficult dynamic because you don't want to be see, seen as um, blaming or um, making someone feel badly for who they are. You want to be a cheerleader. You want to walk alongside them and help them reclaim their health. Be because actually it has to come from within. Jeff had to own this. He had to want to feel better. And now he does. And he's, you know, he's totally changed his life and his diet. And he'll tell you he's thrilled. He's happy to have given up red meat and dairy. And, you know, it's not a big deal anymore. That's a really awesome and profound point and something I never thought of before. Um, when it comes to making dietary recommendations for people, um, a lot of, it never really occurred to me that people could take that uh, dietary advice as a way of blaming that patient when, especially from a provider standpoint and even from a uh, family and loved one standpoint, it's not that you're blaming them, it's the fact that you want to give them some tool, some resource that might be able to just make their life a little bit better. Yep, that's exactly it. And I do think that we miss that because we don't see it from the perspective of the patient. We don't see it from the perspective of the person who's suffering. We see it from our perspective, you know, like, hey, come on, this is all you have to do. But Jeff was really articulate about this with me. And when he really told me how I was making him feel, it broke my heart. And it also made me realize that, you know, I needed to take a different slant on this. <laughs> And that's how I started changing in my blog, too. It was less blamey and more encouraging. And um, encourage just means, with, you know, to give heart, courage. Um, so we give, you know, when we encourage somebody, give your heart and, and um, see things from their perspective. Um, and, and that's really helped me in being an advocate for people with MS now is that Listen, these people are suffering, and it's a horrific disease. Um, and anything that we can do to sort of walk alongside them and help them find ways to reclaim even a little bit of health and energy, um, it's a good thing. That's awesome. Um, so when it comes to approaching doctors, and I'm sure you have a way that you wish the doctors spoke to you, um, yeah. how, do you how do you approach a doctor about a treatment that might be controversial. How do you have that conversation with them? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because, you know, the doctors at Stanford had absolutely no difficulty talking to me. Um, and I, I've talked to researchers and doctors all the time who are respectful and open-minded. I think the most difficult doctors to talk to are ones who are maybe not involved in research who are treating physicians who don't have the time to read the research, who think you're just on the internet and you're, you're just crazy. Um, if you bring them in printouts, they don't want to read it. They don't have the time. Those are the hardest doctors to talk to. Um, I know with Jeff's neurologist and our, uh, our general physician, 
the approach that I find that works <laughs> is um, <sighs> proof is in the pudding. I, I mean, just they see Jeff. They see his blood results now, his, his really great, um, you know, serum cholesterol levels and his inflammation numbers are down and he looks great. And so they see how well he's doing. And so then they start to ask, how did you get there? And then they become more open. So um, it's going to be very, very difficult to get CCSVI treatment approved until we have more basic science, until we have more clinical trials. That's just the truth of the matter. But um, for researchers, uh, you know, I was just at the lab of Dr. Macon Niedegaard, uh, who discovered the lymphatic cleansing system at the University of Rochester. And I just spent four hours in her lab talking with her about the connection of venous flow to the lymphatic, or the glial cells and um, the lymphatic system that we now cl know cleanses the brain at night when we sleep. I mean, this is amazing. This has implications for Alzheimer's. Um, our brain needs sleep to cleanse itself. So as we were speaking, she saw all the connections to the vascular system, the venous system. She didn't have any problem. But um, like I said, she's a researcher, so she's um, surrounded by this. The doctors that you're going to have problems with are the ones who are just, you know, day in, day out practicing physicians. They don't have time for this. And, and they just want to get you in and out of their office. Um, I would say find doctors that want to sit and talk with you. Find a functional medicine doctor. That's the best doctor I've found for Jeff. Someone who will test all of his levels, will take the time with him. Um, you know, these are the doctors that have the time. They may not be covered by your insurance, but um, you'll get some really, really good care and you'll have somebody that will listen to you. So it, it's, um, it's tough. It's tough for patients, especially if they're in PPOs or, you know, healthcare programs that they don't have a choice of their doctors. You know, you struggle along, you do the best you can. But sure. Um, sure. yeah, so I mean, wonderful open doctors are out there, but you have to hunt for them. Sure. Um, if you were to turn back the clock and have the conversation with some of these doctors that disagreed with you, I have a lot of doctors <laughs> and chiropractors and therapists that actually listen to the show. Um, if you were talking to a doctor that is going to disagree with you, how would you wish that they had that conversation with you as a patient? Well, uh, well, first of all, we need time, and that's just usually not available. Sure. But not only, not only time, we need to get rid of our cognitive dissonance. So I would say that a lot of doctors, they, don't, they wouldn't put it this way, but I say that they have a credo. They have a belief system that they are taught a certain way, and everything that they based their practice on is based on this credo. So right now we have the belief system of that multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. And we've had this since the 1940s when um, the, the mouse model, EAE, was invented. Um, and everything that has been based on multiple sclerosis research has been based on this credo, which is that, you know, this is, this is the disease. So they refuse to look at anything else outside because that creates cognitive dissonance. They can't accept it, so they have to kill it. <laughs> so I would just say, open up your mind a little bit. Let's go back and look at the research. Look at this research with me. Look at what T.J. Putnam did in the 1940s when he occluded the, the veins of dogs and he created MS lesions in their brains by just simply closing off the venous drainage. Um, we have connections to the, the venous system that have gone, you know, centuries back. So open up your mind. Let's look at the research with um, this new insight into the new technology that Dr. Paolo Zamboni has. Um, and let's put away our cognitive dissonance and let's have a discussion um, about what's happening now. So... Uh, I mean, it's very hard when you're dealing with someone who's intransigent. intransigent. They just don't want to see any other way. But we have to. We have to put down our preconceived notions, especially when we're dealing with medical research, and especially when we're still discovering things about the brain, like how it cleanses itself and the fact that it has 
lymphatic drainage. My goodness, this is something we never knew. And we have to re-evaluate um, everything in light of these discoveries. The world is not flat. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, to sum up, you just want people to at least approach an idea with a little bit of an open mind and be yes. open to having the conversation. Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I think something that's also very cool and something I wanted to point out, and this is something that I do when I actually go and speak to some MS groups, is I'm very transparent when I tell people and I'm speaking in front of, like, listen, a lot of you who have MS or are family members of people that have MS, um, chances are you know more about MS than I will ever know because that's not my chief focus and chief um, concern. Right. But this is what I can do to possibly help people with that. And I think us as doctors really have to do a better job of acknowledging the fact that when a patient or a loved one of a patient is involved with this terminal chronic illness and they're doing the research that we have to take a step back and acknowledge the fact that they are actively doing their homework and looking for answers and they probably know a little bit more than just the general practicing um, doctor unless they're really super involved in the research. Yeah, well, you're very enlightened and that's a wonderful, wonderful approach. And I think it might be generational. Uh, how old are you? I'm um, 31. Yeah, so I see younger doctors as being much more of that mind, um, and I'm thankful for this, but I think it's because you grew up in the age of the internet and understanding open access journals, and um, I see younger doctors as getting this and being much more collaborative with patients, which is wonderful. So I'm hoping that the next generation um, of MS researchers as they come up We'll listen more to patients and um, caretakers. I think this is a wonderful development. So thank you for doing that. That's really heartening to hear. No problem. So last part of our show, I usually just ask some uh, rapid fire questions where people could get to know you a little bit better. Um, what are some of your favorite resources for general health information? What are your favorite places to look for health information? Oh, the internet, you know, uh, PubMed. Mm -hmm. um, I have, <laughs> I love Dr. Terry Walls for MS information. She's brilliant and I love her website. I love uh, Dr. David Perlmutter. He's so cool and smart. I love the Hubbard Foundation. Um, and I just, boy, I love the, the MS world right now is really opening up. Very cool. What are some things that you do for your own health that do you feel not enough people know about? Huh, that's really good. You know what? I just found out I had a vitamin D deficiency. I had no clue because I'm always outside and my doctor finally tested me. And so now I'm on a supplement and I'm outdoors all the time. And I actually was vitamin D deficient. I mean, we had Jeff tested for his MS, but never had myself tested. So if you're a caregiver, get yourself tested and take care of yourself too. <laughs> Very cool. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you can give for a caregiver with someone with a, a chronic illness? Yeah, so that it ties in. Take care of yourself too. You're not a good caregiver if you're miserable and in pain yourself or tired. Get good sleep, feed yourself well, exercise, have an outside life, see friends, uh, stay engaged with who you are, what your passions are, uh, and don't feel guilty about that. Okay, very good. Um, what are your, some of your favorite books that you like to give out to people? Who? Um, well, Marie Rhodes wrote a really great book that explains CCSVI. So um, CCSVI is the cause of MS. is a really wonderful book, and it's very well researched, and I hand that out uh, whenever I go to conferences. Okay. And... What's the best piece of advice that you have to give for patients who are struggling with the battle of chronic illness? Don't give up. Um, you can change things in your life that will make you feel better. Um, don't feel badly 
if you're struggling and if you're hurting, it's, it's not something you've done. <laughs> um, forgive yourself. Um, and, and then be hopeful. Be hopeful that there are things that you might be able to change that will give you some relief. And if you get a little bit of relief one day, that can snowball and become a bit more relief the next day. So chronic progressive diseases can have periods of remission and healing, and we know that's true. Um, so don't ever give up. Awesome. And um, what? how can people reach you? How do they find out more about you? Obviously, there's your blog. Um, that's ccsvinms.com dot blogspot.com. Um, where else can people reach you at and learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm Joan Beal on Twitter. Um, I have a Facebook page, which we've got 25,000 followers, um, CCSVI and multiple sclerosis on Facebook. Um, that's kind of my, my medical connection world is the blog and Twitter and Facebook right now. And um, that all kind of grew out of this um, very, very small <laughs> um, beginnings. Sure, you're aware of that can give people a little bit of hope and hopefully a little bit of direction to find the care that they need. Wonderful. Great. Great Have to meet you. Thank you so much. You too. Thanks for listening to Heal Yourself Radio. If you like what you hear, show us some love on iTunes by writing a review or by sharing with your friends. We love interacting with our listeners. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash healyourselfradio. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Jonathan Chung. And you can always come to our website at healyourselfradio.com and interacting with us in the comments section. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week.